Never ascertained fear, unexpected interruption as anything more than a short pause for the recognition of horror that some of us unfortunately must endure. A lawless spirit is one that is not perturbed by punishment or pain. For when you are on righteous ground of truth, ten brave, determined and fearless warriors are worth more than a hundred weaker. So let me tell you, Pat Dudgeon, if a dark cloud appears, let us know. Around the neck of some of us they hang medals and others they hang nooses. So is the trickery of the white man. This is for my young Kudda. He's a young Nyungar boy who is a severe petrol sniffer. A young boy who dances in the bitter cold winds as they blow from the Canning River. Silhouetted wet in the shadows of darkness. Beneath the crosses of the Clontarf Catholic Church as they strike the lights of Curtin University. I hope that he is afforded the carrying arms of a stranger who will ultimately carry him home, for soon he will be dead. He knows that no king plate or breast plate hangs around my neck. We give great homage to our warriors who were chained and shackled, incarcerated forever into the forbidden lands. There are many introduced prophets and saviours on crosses that blemish our lands, forged of belief systems from foreign countries alien to our creation stories that have linked us to the belonging of this land and laws since the beginning of time. Christianity, Islam, Hinduism, the Baha'i faith, Shintoism, Buddhism and all other world religions have contaminated the true indigenous spirituality of this land that has governed the ceremonies of our 14 great nations. Our culture is alive and our culture is strong. Our marbone is powerful. In the old days, our medicine boy, our men would climb to sacred mountain peaks and generate power from the rolling thunder and the massive lightning strikes. May the echoes be heard again across the campfires of our leaders and far into the despair of the hearts of our broken spirits. The knowledge of how to nurture life with life, the great prongrups, the oldest granite formation on the earth, a thousand million years old. Stories of relations giving evidence to holes where the spirits dwell. This was the very first place on earth where flora bore colour, the red of the kangaroo paw. White people measure the wealth of this land in terms of its mineral wealth, such as gold, silver, copper, nickel, iron ore, coal, gas, gemstones such as diamonds and opals, sapphires, and the yet-to-come full-scale mining of U308 pure yellow cake uranium. Our people measure the spiritual importance of this land in terms of the ochre, the ancient paint that differentiated man from all other life forms. White representing women's law gave evidence to the body fluids of life, the wetlands, the ancient law grounds of Nyungar women's religious sites. Red ochre, the Wilji, the bloodline links with our great moieties, the Wadong, the Crow and the Manich, the white cockatoo. The giving of the knowledge of skin groups and the great majestic Karak, the red-tailed black cockatoo, the firebringer, and Guya, the rainmaker. A great leader of the Canning area that forged frontier respect by white people and his own was Yagan. Yagan stated to advocate George Fletcher Moore on the eve of his death, you come to our country, you have driven us from our lands. We can no longer walk in our own country. We are fired upon by the white man. Why should the white man treat us so? Following his death, his head was severed from his body. His skin flayed to remove his ceremonial markings of manhood and some time later his head was put up on public display in St George's Terrace as a deterrent to black resistance. In 1839, General George Fletcher Moore stated, 
we are no match for them and the only way that we can beat them is to turn them against each other. I would like to give recognition to our great elders who were the buddhiyas of their buja at the time of colonisation. The great elder, Wailo, Midjiguru, Yoganga, Bolbuk, Banyalo, Yagan, Weep and Munda. The custodians of the lands of the Bankshia ceremonies. The hills peoples, the peoples of the wetlands and lake regions and the peoples of the great southern swamps. 150 years ago in Western Australia, Aboriginal people were declared under the Flora and Fauna Act. This allowed the widespread propaganda that Australia was terra nullius, void of human life. More tragically, it lit the fires of extermination where the bodies of our people burned to ashes as massacres of Holocaust proportions were instigated right throughout this country. Many of the water holes were poisoned and laced with strychnine. Our women were forced slaves to the white masters. Sacred and significant religious sites were violated and destroyed. Sacred ceremonial objects stolen and pillaged. The Christian missionaries had commenced their strategy to religiously colonise our people. These past atrocities coupled with the 1905 Native Welfare Act that enforced the laws governing the forced removal of Aboriginal children from their biological parents were, I believe, deliberate strategies of social experimentations that would give evidence to future attempts to nullify the bloodlines and eventually eradicate all existence of Aboriginal life. The bones and the skeletal body parts of our people were dispersed throughout world laboratories for scientific research, also as macabre souvenirs. Many skulls of our proud warriors were carved to become ashtrays within the confines of the wealthy homes of the aristocrats of Britain and Europe. Our old people's way of life has all but nearly been destroyed. The language, ceremonial knowledge and wisdom that existed and was passed through thousands of generations lies in its diluted and its minimised form within the archives of anthropological interests. Confined to political and academic institutions, like the cultural objects of our once great warriors, they have now become the trophies of the white man's ruthless obsession to conquer and colonise. Our sacred and significant sites of great ceremonial importance, including our traditional burial grounds, have become tourist meccas and playgrounds for affluent middle-class white Australians destroying their spiritual and cultural entity, where now their value is only determined in the amount of dollars in which they generate from tourism. Our traditional bush medicine, found in the rich and the unique flora and fauna of this land, which has great healing power, has become commercially explored by pharmaceutical companies, naturopaths, botanists, herbalists and self-proclaimed healers, who explore and scientifically research its medical components for vaccinations and cures for world sickness, whilst multinational companies promote and market them as new age lotions and potions. The extensive totemic wildlife of our lands are now bred to farm for the sale of their unique byproducts, offered as menu items across international restaurants, appearing on multinational supermarket shelves, satisfying a world market of curiosity and difference, whilst vast majorities of many life forms have now been declared rare or extinct since colonisation. Our sacred and significant cultural objects, such as the didgeridoo, clapsticks, bull roarers, are all marketed and sold as unique souvenirs, becoming mantelpiece ornaments and objects of foreign New Age practice, what was once sacred objects for ceremonial use now echo out from world orchestras, rock bands and street corner buskers. Our great symbols of ancient stories representing creation, ceremonies since time memorial, are imitated and solicited onto tourist products, lining the walls of Devonshire tea rooms, art in public place projects, government propaganda and commercial product selling. Our people's spiritual and cultural pride has been reduced to suffering the humiliation of generating economics from our traditional heritage, capitalising on colonisation, selling our culture, trading our spirituality, whilst you wine, dine, play golf and football on our once great hunting grounds. Our culture is promoted by government as an industry, creating opportunities for commercial sustainability, classified as art, our traditional dances become theatrics for the pleasure of middle-class white audiences, our welcome to ceremonial gatherings and smoking ceremonies have become feel-good political ideologies and concepts.
given credence to the falsity of reconciliation, while the vast majority of Noongar people are continuously dying and suffering from introduced sickness, both in the physical, spiritual and emotional sense. Our religious stories enforced into the world's marketplaces sold as investment product, where value is determined by non-Aboriginal financial interests such as Sotheby's auctioneers, multinational publishing companies such as HarperCollins and private sector business owners who continuously exploit our spirituality for every dollar they can parasite from it. This policy strategy defines the evolutionary process of spiritual colonisation, stripping Noongar people of dignity and cultural integrity. I am not an Australian or Indigenous Australian. I am a Noongar man. I stand in respect of the flag of the Aboriginal people, the red, black and yellow. I do not recognise the Australian flag. It's a butcher's apron. The Union Jack and Southern Cross is bloodstained from the massacres of our people. And it is a hypocrisy to serve two symbolic flags of national identity when history clearly demonstrates that the Union Jack and the Christian crucifixes flew over the bodies of our people as they were trampled by horse hoofs into the blood-filled dirt. Babies lie crying, then the massacre grounds became silent. Killing for the sake of conquering on macabre pleasure to let fall a life to die where it is slaughtered without using its entities such as its flesh, skin, sinews, oils, feathers or other aspects for ceremonial use and survival as opposed to the senseless killing of war which takes from your spirit of humanity until there is no more. This creates a massive hole in the hearts of people, a void that needs to be filled and is often vulnerable to influences such as self-destruction and suicide. I believe that upon the invaded and the conquered grounds of the world's Indigenous peoples, there is a great shadow cast of anger, bitterness, hatred and fear. Desperation, superficial pretense of superiority, bestowed on the hearts and the minds of those who kill to gain land and wealth. For if you respect as Aboriginal people did the killing of life for survival, respecting totemic significance, the strength of that life becomes part of you, enabling you to live and become strong with a true sense of belonging. Australia is not my country and I do not recognise the politics of state independence. I do not use the term country in description of my sense of belonging. I recognise the meaning of Buja, the land of my religious ancestors, the word for the fetus in the mother's womb, the meaning of the impregnation of spirit, the sacredness of our religion and our belonging to this land through the creative movements of our great serpent, the Woggle. The never-ending and continuing population of the white man coming with gunpowder alloyed steel bayonets and swords was the very strength of power without compromise, negotiation or treaty of his ability to conquer the lands in which he invaded. During the mid-1980s, following an extensive racist graffiti campaign, bomb blasts echoed throughout Perth from Asian-owned businesses, detonated from the neo-Nazi Australian nationalist movement Welcome to the hometown of the self-acclaimed Hitler-styled leader of that movement, the white supremacist Jack Van Tongren. I would like to take this opportunity to thank the organisers for myself and Selena to be able to speak here today. I find an ironic hypocrisy that the conference is sponsored by the West Australian Police Department, where we know the continued brutal death squads of blue uniforms, crown badges, handcuffs, batons, pepper sprays, Tazars and firearms have committed severe crimes of murder, bashings, rapes and the framing of, framing of innocent Noongar people, dragged into hell holes of fear, hopelessness and eventual suicide. The misconceived hype of police statistics and reports create fear, prioritising the Aboriginal youth crime that climbs through your lounge room and bedroom windows to strike three and you're in for 12 months are crimes of opportunity. These acts of crimes are committed by the networking of more severe and organised criminals in the upper part of town in the Northbridge business area, awaiting the arrival of stolen goods for small amounts of drugs traded. Aboriginal youth crime is nothing more than a transitional domino effect of an exploitive manipulative network system that is generated from a higher level of operational demand 
exploiting addiction and poverty. This level of operation in the media is often referred to as the business identities of Perth. I'm not going to talk from a psychological, clinical perspective or academic critique of descriptivism theories as I am certainly not an academic or scholar. It is very apt, however, that such a conference dealing with racism is being held here in Perth. This city has an underlining value of corruption, subtle institutionalised racism, extreme racial brutality and politically oppressive government policies. It has based organised racist movements operating in the suburbs such as the Ku Klux Klan and war, which is the abbreviation of the white Australian revolutionaries, and sponge, which is the abbreviation for the society of the prevention of niggers getting everything. This city has had many racial slayings, including the barbaric, sadistic and brutal torture of a young Noongar man, Cleon Jackamurra, rest in peace. The police killing of John Pat in the northern suburb, in John Pat in the northern town of Roban, became the symbolic death of the Royal Commission into Aboriginal Deaths in Custody, which found Western Australia and Queensland to have the highest statistics per population for Aboriginal deaths while it's in custodial institutions. The horrendous murder of Louis Johnson, the young Aboriginal man who was run down to his death by a gang of racist thugs in Scarborough and was left to die at the side of the road by the St John Ambulance fools who declared him as they kicked him as only being a drunk. Ricky Vincenti, shot to death while escaping on the wire at Canningvale Prison, whilst the perimeter patrol vehicle was on the other side of the wall. And this is dirty. Recently, an 11-year-old girl in a Perth suburban school was pepper sprayed by three police officers. They emptied an entire can on her eyes, face and neck. For weeks later, the noted racist talkback show hosted by bigots such as Howard Sattler on 6PR and the print media of the West Australian rag under the editor and bigot Paul Armstrong were inundated by callers declaring that this young girl got exactly what she deserved. Like many other young Noongar kids, she was pushed into a frightening, dark and lonely corner of despair of racial slurs, taunts and racial ridicules. She responded by waving a pair of plastic paper cutting scissors at the offenders. In 1996, a noted Noongar man, Mr Greg Quartermain from the Kalakabadi community, was brutalised and bashed by police officers beyond recognition and was comatose somewhere between life and death for many weeks following a high-speed car chase. The murder of Mr Carl Woods by the West Australian police who crushed his facial bone structures to a pulp. In not one of these cases were these officers charged or prosecuted. In fact, the police officers involved in the John Pat case were awarded positions in considered less harsh communities and in rank and salary. Many politicians and corporate managers at conferences and forums often say and boast to interstate and international guests, welcome to Perth, our most beautiful city. I say that Perth is no doubt the most racial city in what could be argued as the most racist country in the world. It is a city of extreme conservatism and has been declared as the whitest city in the world. The West Australian media exploits the dispossession and the tragic circumstances of Aboriginal people, forever avoiding the truth and reality of the history of this country, while serving the interests of the power of greed and deceit, determining the interests of the wealthy. The Western Australian media pollutes the minds of people, maintaining the status quo of conservatism, racial oppression and social dominance. I don't believe in reconciliation. It is as absurd as Catholic penance and has pacified the spiritual resistance. I give great credence to our old people and ancestors who lost their lives against the forced occupation of our lands. I don't believe in Nelson Mandela, Mahatma Gandhi, Martin Luther King, Malcolm X, Muhammad Ali or the Dalai Lama. I believe in our indigenous religion and not introduce religious beliefs bearing false prophecies of salvation. I believe only in my own feelings and experiences, what I observe when eyes of bitterness and hatred strike my consciousness, when the blood of our people is smeared over cold concrete and when the hands of monsters destroy forever the beautiful innocence of precious young Noongar lives. 
Our solace and our salvation as Aboriginal people will not be defined by academic doctrines, degrees or theses, nor will our struggle be pacified by created leadership through media, political or ministerial appointments, or bestowing on our weak the illusionary false status of power positions of authority, such as associated professorships, doctors' titles or statesmen's profiles, nor will our strengths be unified by introduced religious, nor will it be solicited from the halls of Geneva nor will it be found in the greed of politics, where eruption of the very core of democracy is eroded by corruption and deceit now more evident than ever. White people believe that assimilation is achieved only when an Aboriginal person is educated to a higher level of consciousness, when his mind is educated by a civilised elementary higher than that of barbaric savagery. He believes that all that endeavours to survive outside of his world will ultimately perish. Genocide has gouged the eyes from our people and cut our tongue. We walk in the darkness of despair, cast out like paupers from kingdoms into darkness where the ancestral spirits light the fears of the Junga, the Wudachi and the Pulyats, where sounds of familiarity turn strange, creating fear of spiritual torment and psychological anguish, a never-ending deterioration of the spiritual world of our ancestral songlines, our dreams and ceremonies. Our children walk in swamps of mud, fear of dreams no longer interpreted by wisdom of culture, incarcerated mentally forever into his assimilative processes of education and religion. Our elders must take the hands of our frail and our young and lead them into the light. The Aboriginal struggle and cause for this generation is to rebuild the cultural and the spiritual strengths of our people's identity, to generate pride and knowledge of who we are as a people and where we belong in the vast diversity of all living things, to re-establish the authority and respect of our elders so their knowledge and experience can again become the beacons through the darkness of pain and suffering, reigniting the ashes of our once great campfires, lighting the way for the unification of our people. I am a survivor of racism. For years the words nigger, abo, coon and boom were cast at me in the confines of the school playgrounds. In the classroom, I was a constant target for rubbish projectiles. The despair I faced was the silence from the voyeurs who edged on the actions and the inability of any of the teachers to deal with it. I remember vividly wiping blood from my face as I fought my way through to safe ground and I fought my whole life through. As I became older, I was humiliated by being refused entry into hotels and nightclubs, asked for membership whilst my Wadjula friends gained unquestionable entry. I encountered severe confrontations with the old 21st squad in New South Wales, who glorified in racial taunts and demands. I was dragged and severely assaulted by the WA police officers using batons whilst my nine-year-old brother was made to look on. I was systemised onto the West Australian police files at 21 and told to remove myself from the whites only bar at the Robin Hotel and go around to the back where the Blacks Bar was. I was assaulted and victimised by the West Australian Vice Squad in the Perth lockup whilst officially working. I was instructed that if I rendered a certain detective's number to the authorities as a complaint, that my family would find my body on the banks of the Swan River with every bone broken. I was assured by the then Attorney General that I was to be placed under parliamentary observation. I experienced the fear of having a police officer's gun pointed directly at my face. At 38, my home in the northern suburbs of Perth was raided and ransacked by the WA police. This followed running the Yokai Human Rights Rally in Perth. They stated that they were following up on an anti-graffiti campaign titled Wipeout. During my life, I have encountered many varying forms and experiences of institutionalised racism, as well as direct prejudices of a sarcastically mockering nature. They continue to this very day. When I walk through shopping centres and take, for instance, Myers, and especially, in, in particular, their cosmetic section. <laughs> I would like to take this opportunity to read two letters, edited but not censored, that have been sent to Aboriginal organisations in Perth during the past from racist organised groups. One was actually sent straight to my older brother, Dennis Eggington, at the Aboriginal Legal Service, and uh, give my great respects for you being here today, Den. The first is from a group called WAR, standing for White Australian Revolutionaries. 
War is a group of white, Bible-believing Christian men who are proud of our race and our heritage. We will be watching. We are sick of having our taxes taken to support godless minorities. We are sick of losing our lands to Aborigines. We are sick of having our guns taken by the Fabian socialists in Canberra. White men built this country and white men are this country. Pauline Hanson is a great Australian patriot who warns us of the betrayal of some who will destroy our identity. We will carry out direct action against sodomites, perverts, illegal aliens and race traders and destroy the places that they gather at. We will also assist the West Australian Police Force in maintaining order at public meetings so all Australians have a chance to be heard. Awake, white men. Time is short. Join the struggle now. War. The second is from Sponge. Society for the Prevention of Niggers Getting Everything. What a hypocritical apology for human beings you blacks are. You stand there on television and you make excuses for the black excreta that have wreaked havoc on the city trains. You are a lawless bunch of misfits. Teach your black rubble how to wash themselves and launder their clothes, how to speak properly without the filth that comes out from their mouths. If you black bludgers want to wage war, why don't you do it with guns so we whites can take up arms against you and this time wipe you out completely? Don't think that reconciliation will ever happen. We will never reconcile with filth because a politician who wants to vote is not representing the true feelings of all Australians. One day it will all be returned back to us, the whites. If I ever catch a black bastard near my daughter, I'll shoot him on the spot. And I've got hundreds of mates who will do the same. J. Jackson, Pinjara, Sponge. Aboriginal people were powerless to defend themselves against alloyed steels and gunpowder with wood fibre weapons. Our people are a peaceful and passive people. That is why you can walk today in any Australian city and not fear the explosions of hydrochloric or nail bombs. Junga Minya Bominga, the smell of the white man is killing us. It is the statement of the Dumbatung Aboriginal Corporation which we use to describe the continuing oppression and the spiritual genocide of our people. May our campfires burn forever. <laughs>